Okay, people, so the new fiscal year for Shonen Jump is upon us, and we got a brand new manga. Y'all know recently we had a couple of cancellations of some series that a lot of the community was really digging. A lot of people were really hype about the Hunter's Guild, Red Hood, including myself, likewise with the series Nieru Way of the Martial Artist. So it was a big blow to fans of these brand new titles when Shonen Jump announced, boom, over with, at very early stages of both of those mangas run. However, we got a couple of new serializations Last week we talked about the new series from Yuji Kaku, the author of Hell's Paradise, Ayashimon. Now this week we got a new one that, I ain't gonna lie, the title is a little complicated to pronounce. I wish they would have actually either had a whole different title in Japanese or for the English version translated a little bit because it's a little complex. I guess it's Doron Dororon. We're gonna go with Doron Dororon or Doron Dororon. Something like that. I'm not, I'm not sure how we're supposed to pronounce it, but yeah. Doron Dororon. <laughs> And I think I added too many Roros in there. Anyway, the latest new serialization to Shonen Jump magazine. And it definitely feels like it's following the, not necessarily tradition, but the new age format of what people want in Shonen manga. And what I mean by that is, you got some classic things of some sword slashing, some demon quote-unquote-esque monsters to take care of. There's uh, obviously a formula now that is becoming more and more um, of a staple, shall I say, in Shonen manga because of the magic massive explosion of yes you, you know what i'm about to say demon slayer kimetsu no yaiba i feel like that manga really changed the landscape of jump like we would probably be having so many different types of manga right now if it wasn't for demon slayer's explosion because then of course we got something like jujutsu kaisen which is again a more darker shonen you know combating curses similar to like demons and stuff like that and that seems to be again something that shonen jump is trying to stay in that realm of yeah fighting and slaying monsters demons or in this case Mononoke because seemingly with this series that's the main threat and I gotta be honest with you this one is another one that I feel like please Shonen Jump <laughs> you're two in a row which is normally either one or the other like when they bring new serializations I'm usually like maybe hype about one out of like three or four that they'll announce I'll be like this one's alright but uh, in this case out of the three new ones so far that we got um, this one I'm actually really digging as well like there's three of them right now I want to say there was one by the author of that one piece spinoff manga not really a big fan of that one but Ayashimon by Yuji Kaku is fire so far and this brand new one Doron Dororon is pretty freaking hype so far as well and I'm liking the direction and I gotta throw in there yo Shonen Jump give it a shot Shonen Jump don't just cancel it because maybe people aren't gravitating towards it immediately Shonen Jump let this manga prosper because it's low-key fuego let's get into it no matter how you Okay, people, so this manga, Doron Dororon, starts off where basically giving us a little bit of exposition of what the heck we're in store for. Around 50 years ago, strange monsters called Mononoke started appearing and attacking humans, and essentially that's one of the big, you know, obstacles of this series, one of the big threats, so to speak. And in the past year, they killed roughly 4,049 people nationwide, and they usually strike roughly every three days in big cities. So it gave us a lot of exposition and a very small amount of time that was all like in the first page of like boom here's what we got boom here's what we're facing boom here's the destructive nature of what they're capable of thus far so okay setting things up very nicely but it didn't feel like it was you know just dumping on us which was a mistake something like samurai 8 the follow-up series to the creator of naruto a mistake he made of hey let me just throw a million things at you this one was like boom here's the threat okay let's keep on going because we see some really awesome color pages that i ain't gonna lie i love when we start off with the color pages sometimes it makes me think like Man, I love my black and white manga, but when they throw them color pages and they know how to actually color, it be looking a little low-key fire. And we see what appears to be the main character on a color page with a big monster. I'm guessing that's one of the Mononoke. And it is on top of and crushing a woman. And then we see further down on the page, we see the main character alongside some little creature that looks kind of like a Pokemon, which you'll later find out in the chapter is a pretty significant and important character. But definitely, it gives you the vibe right there. I almost feel like immediately of what 
what you're in store for with this manga. You're going to get a little bit of tragedy, a little bit of dark stuff. You're going to get the reasoning behind why this guy is so hateful because, yeah, this main character, he is, think, Eren with the Titans. He, he's kind of prejudiced against the Mononoke. He absolutely despises them. It's hard for him to even entertain the thought of even being in their presence without wanting to rip their freaking heads off after what we see later on in the chapter of him and, you know, how he gets introduced to this one Mononoke, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And we also get to see that really awesome and epic color page of, again, what seems to be the main character alongside a chick with a sword. And I love how it looked like she had, like, designer clothing on, but at the same time, it kind of had a similar pattern to something like, again, Demon Slayer, like the way the Hashira clothing would look like or Tanjiro or something like that. Kind of gave me vibes of that, but designer in a weird way. And then we jump into a scene where this character is at a graveyard and he's recounting all of the bad things that happened to him in school in terms of sent home for fighting, expelled from fighting, suspended for fighting, like apparently dude is a fighter. Again, similar to, there's a lot of similarities now that I think about it between this main character, which by the way, his name is Dora, 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 the Explorer. Yo, imagine like <laughs> a Dora manga where Dora the Explorer is fighting these monsters called Mononoke. No. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just started thinking right now, holy cow, this main character and some elements of this manga kind of reminiscent of the other new serialization in Jump Ayashimon. Just want to keep that in mind. Because the dude apparently loves to fight. He be kicking major tail up in school. And as he continues to talk there at the graveyard, he says, despite all of that and even not doing well with, you know, tests and all that jazz, he still managed to pass high school. So that also gives us again in a interesting way exposition of okay boom this is who this character is he just graduated high school so you got to imagine maybe he's like 18 years old somewhere around there again i'm not sure how the japanese schooling system leads them into but i'm imagining it's probably around there which i like that yeah a little bit older not 15 not 14 not 12 yeah give me a, a 17 18 year old that just feels a little bit cut above the brim so we can get a little bit more of some mature elements of things happening and not have to feel like oh well that's a young kid and sadly this main character is speaking to his mom his mom that passed away which you got to imagine you cut back to that colored page in the beginning the woman that's crushed under the mononoke probably his mother and he's telling his mother that boom now that i've graduated from high school i am going to become a samurai just like his mother wanted because his mother that that's i guess one of her dying wishes is that she wanted him to become a samurai and he wants to make his mother proud and here's where we get the introduction to another character the female that we see in that color page and i don't even think we actually got her name in this one that's kind of bizarre now that i think about it like the author really wasn't too pressed about giving us names i, I don't even think we heard what dora's name was until like halfway through the chapter i was kind of like oh because yeah i don't think we got this female's name but we see the female samurai from the colored page she's hunting down there was some sort of mononoke that was seemingly kidnapping a child which i guess is a part of the big gang of this whole entire chapter and that samurai girl hunts him down and slashes him up and it's like okay so she's pretty epic now i think about it she actually kind of reminds me of kikoru from kaiju number eight character design wise slightly and again more exposition with seemingly there's like different forces so again giving me vibes and i know i'm probably name dropping like a million series right now but giving me vibes and maybe like a world trigger because she's a part of the izanagi force and they're apparently like really good at public safety and stopping these creatures and also it felt very simplistic in terms of like they're called samurai the forces that are all you know the people that actually do this job they're just called simply samurai which okay like you could have been a little bit more creative like you know the the slayer squad or something well no slayer demon slayer i don't know the freaking berserk capturers or something there instead of just samurai but why not i mean at the end of the day if it's not like an actual samurai based story usually they don't even use that word anymore in manga and stuff like that um, again unless it's like straight up like a roroni kenshin type of tale so sure the samurai and our main character dora sasaki which that's his actual name and again i still can't get over it Yo, if this shit becomes a big thing one day, like, oh my god, we're gonna be like, yo, shout outs to Dora, like, Dora's my guy, like, <laughs> but Dora Sasaki, he witnesses what just happened, the slaying of that Mononoke, and he hears about the test that's about to go down in order to potentially become a samurai, and he's like, boom, I'm gonna do it, and epically fails and i'm like okay <laughs> where we're going with all this because it definitely didn't feel like while there were many tropes of course of you know shonen manga and stuff like that it didn't necessarily feel completely conventional like you know deku goes to ua and becomes a part of the school and stuff like that like it was flirting with certain traditional storytelling methods and shonen methods and whatnot but still trying to take different avenues of like well shit throughout even the end of the chapter dora never became a part of any squad or anything like that but the weird thing is is that they were drawing blood and that was like a part of the exam to 
to get in because apparently they have this kit that they draw the blood and they figure out based on the blood that they draw from you whether or not you have some really you know potential essentially with supernatural energy because in order to become a samurai you basically have to have that as a prerequisite if you don't even have some supernatural energy they're like eh what good are you so again a lot of setup in a way but it doesn't feel how can I say this like force fed I don't feel like I'm being barraged by it as I'm reading this chapter it just feels kind of like it's naturally flowing there's still jokes involved of like his reaction to it he's like you know I'm gonna be a samurai the next chapter you failed like huh like and they didn't drum it up either and again it was a simple test and a weird test like if I was to give it a comparison again throwing names out there kind of like Yu Yu Hakusho when they were going through Genkai's test and it was like these simple things like if you touch the leaf or the paper if you don't turn it a certain color then automatically you fail like kind of reminds me of something simple like that but as you know standard usual like hey it's ironic that apparently he has zero supernatural energy so essentially he could never become a samurai because that's a prerequisite to even get in and Again, not breaking the mold in that aspect and then the whole scene with the big brolic dude that pushed away and you know he was going through the line and cutting the line and how Dora just grabs him by the wrist and drags him and he's like yo um it gives you a, an idea I guess of his morality of the main character's morality of like yo you try to skip things who who do you think you are fam we're going to the back and we're gonna restart this bad boy and the instructor's like no you're not you cannot retake this exam just you failed fam that's it and with the amount of flashbacks we get to the past of Dora and his mother and things that his mother said definitely feel feels integral to Dora moving forward like I could see 50 chapters from now there's going to be major plot twists whether it be something that was related to his mother or something that like there's going to be a lot of things connecting this character I believe to his mother that even intertwines with the story and stuff like that because we got like three or four different times of flashbacks of him and his mother and how important his mother and his life and how she was the inspiration for him to get started and even wanting to be a samurai like she was integral and is integral to who he is right now because getting the reasoning of how he even got this dream, essentially his goal to become a samurai was one day he just offhandedly said, eh, I'm gonna be a samurai. And his mom loved the idea of like, yo, you're a punk. You don't do shit anyway. So, hey, make me proud. That actually sounds really dope. Like, yeah, go be a good guy instead of kicking ass all around there and shit like that. Actually use your fist and, and your strength and all that jazz for something good for once, you know? But again, something like what I was saying with the other manga that just started in Jump Aya Shimon. This guy is really, really strong because he kicks a rock and it bounces off and then busts him in his face and I'm like yeah, I mean, I, I guess you could throw that in there as possibly like, oh, it was just a coincidence and shit, but there's been a lot of examples like him pulling the muscular guy away that's like humongous and stuff of, this guy is freakishly strong, but he still seemingly is just a normal human, apparently, right? But in coming, basically, the second half of the chapter where things start to get a little quote-unquote real because he hears something of, you won't get away, and he goes to check out, okay, well, what the heck is going on here, where kind of feels like, okay, he has a strong sense of justice, or you could argue it's not even about the justice, it's just he really hates and he's like, Mononoke, where, fam? Where? Get me my pistol. I'm about to... Yeah, dude really hates the Mononoke. And every time I say Mononoke, I think of the movie, what is it called? Princess Mononoke? And he sees a little kid running away, basically, from Mononoke. And we hear a Mononoke saying, my little Chewy Chewy. And I'm like, oh my god, that sounds so freaking creepy. Like, if this ever gets animated one day, like, that sound needs to sound horrifying because reading it kind of was horrifying. Like, you're going after a little kid and you're gonna hurt a little kid kill a little kid or whatever you're gonna do to him and you say my little chewy like that was creepy and also again a little more exposition a lot of little details in here of apparently the mononoke that say things like that my little chewy are real bad news but our main character dora runs to see what the heck is going on and stop this mononoke that was hurting this child and essentially help out whoever's up there and this really gives some interesting characterization into our main character and just how badly he really hates the mononoke because he's going up there because he thinks somebody like possibly from you know the samurai force or whatever one of those squads is up there and he sees a giant gorilla looking mononoke and then like a squid or it kind of looks like almost like a pokemon wrapped around them and he's like who's even calling out there all i see is two mononoke so he hates these things so bad that it didn't even register to him at all he couldn't even fathom that oh no the mononoke that is wrapped around the other guy is a good guy like that's how much he hates them and how prejudiced and hateful he is towards them that it's like it didn't register immediately like this one was actually doing a good thing in fact he had to get convinced over and over again throughout the chapter that no the, the squid looking pokemon looking dude he's actually good and the little squid as it's wrapped around the gorilla mononoke is like i'm not gonna let you do any more bad things especially to kids and all that jazz and the gorilla's like you've never tasted human so you probably wouldn't say that if you did fam get off of me 
me move. Again, giving a little bit of like, okay, this squid thingy is somewhat righteous, right? Like, or has a reason to be righteous at the very least of wanting to do the right thing and protecting children. And again, it just reinforces even more that Dora just can't comprehend as the squid is saying like, yo, run, don't worry, I got this, just go away. Like he still is, it's not registering. Like he's doing the right thing. He's trying to help me. He helped the kid. Like, no, 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 no. something is wrong here. This isn't real. And if it wasn't for the squid jumping and biting the gorilla as he was approaching Dora, I don't think it still would have hit him. Like it took a lot of convincing for him to understand what the heck was happening here in this whole scene. Because you did that and you bit the freaking gorilla thing, I can't leave you here to die, I guess. Like, come on, let's scram up out of here. So it was like, there's still a righteousness in him that despite the fact that again, he really clearly hates these things. He's really, really badly about it. Ultimately, he's like, all right, I guess I'll save you. You did something right, whatever. And we get a little bit of exposition as to why the squid saved the kid. Basically, he says the reason he did it is because he wants to make the world a kind place where no one gets hurt. And here's a crazy theory that I thought as soon as I read that page, because I was looking closely at that squid thingy and I was like, there's like a tattoo mark on his forehead. I'm calling it right now. That's probably a mark that is stopping this creature from being a massive, dangerous Mononoke. If that mark was to come off or something was to happen, he'll probably turn into a man-eating creature or something. And the reason he's like this is because he doesn't want to be like that anymore. Maybe in his past or in his other form, he's just a danger and he's done so many horrible things things and he's trying to rectify it by protecting humans and stuff like that i'm just saying because it just felt very noticeable that little tattoo mark on his forehead could just be a little blemish it could just be a part of his design i feel like i've read enough shonen to say there's something more to it and the mononoke goes on to say like i don't care whether it's a human or a mononoke i just don't like bad guys period so it's kind of funny that the monster the mononoke doesn't discriminate yet the human over there does irony baby irony and it also gives you an idea of how smart some of these creatures can be because he goes on to say that that gorilla mononoke actually has like almost damn near a syndicate of lackeys and stuff that they're kidnapping kids and doing all these horrible things so this one is pretty intelligent but also the gorilla is intelligent enough to have lackeys and do all of these kidnappings and creepy ass stuff and like i was saying earlier again another flashback to the past of him with his mother and that's something else that i feel was one of the final solidifying things that made him not necessarily change his mind but stop completely looking with contempt at this squid creature because he thinks back similar to what the creature just said about you know wanting to save people and make a kind and better world back when he was with his mother that was something that he said as well because his father died and it left the mother devastated and she was always crying and that was kind of one of the catalysts to make him want to be a good person and why even offhandedly later on in life he eventually said i want to be a samurai it was part of him he was even back then saying like i'm the leak samurai and i wonder if the leak samurai is going to be like his nickname throughout the series like they're gonna be like hey that's the leaked samurai as he goes and saves people throughout but one of the final characterization pieces which i hope moving forward we don't keep getting back to this like okay it was throughout the entire chapter again flashbacks and setting the foundation of who his character is because we even see again that the reason why he can't accept things like this creature being good or that a mononoke could be good at all is the fact that a mononoke was responsible for the death of his mother so think like more prejudiced version of ichigo kurosaki and you know his past with his mother dying and bleach like that's kind of same scenario except he's like racist and prejudiced as hell and ichigo was just kind of like yo what but then the gorilla catches up with them and busses them through a wall and it kind of shows the durability of the mononoke that he turned into like a steel plate also some of his capabilities that he could even you know transform his you know body shape and whatnot he transformed into like a steel plate and even though they went flying through the freaking wall they were somewhat okay thanks to that and i ain't gonna lie got a little scary and creepy when they're outside of a freaking elementary school now and i'm like this dude he was already trying to kidnap kids and do all sorts of creepy shit now we're outside of an elementary school with little kids like oh god whoever this mangaka is he was taking it to some dark or flirting with some dark routes at the very least like no let's go that way not 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 that way no i feel like the the proper shonen thing would be that you know 50 to 100 to 200 chapters later on down the road we will find out that somehow some way dora is not actually just all human he's a part mononoke maybe his father was a mononoke or that was wasn't even really his father he'll find out that he actually has mononoke powers but at the very least for right now and i would love if it's 
understood that way, to be honest with you. I'd be fine if there was no plot twist of him being part Mononoke, you know, again, 200 chapters down the road, is where he takes the bottle, he breaks a bottle and tries to attack the gorilla, and he's so weak against the Mononoke. Like, he's strong against normal humans and shit like that, but against the Mononoke, he was so weak that the Mononoke, the gorilla's like, oh man, I just lost all interest in you. Like, you tried it, you thought something, I, uh, j just move. But at the very least, during that entire exchange, Toro was able to deduce, like, wait a minute, you have a bite mark on your ankle still from what happened with the Mononoke. Okay, I kind of need that Mononoke's help. Like, that, that was actually effective slicing through you. And it took Dora a lot. It took a lot of self-exploration for Dora. Hey, no. <laughs> it took Dora a lot to come to grips with the fact that, yo, despite I hate Mononoke from the bottom of my heart, let me ask this squid-looking motherfucker for some help. Let me ask him, like, yo, let's work together so we can take this creature down and seemingly right there was the start of their bond for however long this series is going to go because they also kind of make a pact essentially where he's like yo let's make the world a, a better place or a kind and happy place and that's right there something that i feel is going to be integral to who they are as a duo moving forward in the story because as the gorilla is about to eat some kids boom they come and chop his arm off and you see that essentially that mononoke now was able to transform into a sword and dora is wielding it so yeah that extra strength that he's not you know necessarily a normal human with strength he's able to wield the sword and cut off the gorilla and it's like okay now we're cooking with gas now we're able to do something and they believe in each other proper shonen stuff and they're able to slash the gorilla mononoke in half seemingly vanquishing him which okay i could tell that this is probably all going to be one really epic first episode if this ever gets animated because it like had beat by beat for the most part a lot of typical shonen stuff but i don't know i just really rocked with a lot of this stuff it just kind of feels like the basic foundation and setups for something a lot more grandiose moving down the road and the designs from the mononoke was pretty cool the main character dora he's interesting it's i guess a little twist in and of itself of just how much he freaking hates these creatures and just because he may have formed the pact and a bond with this one in particular doesn't necessarily mean from now on when he sees mononoke he's going to be loving and, and you know caring to them like he probably still really hates them it's just this one in particular is like oh i, I rock with this one but the rest of them no so i guess that's interesting Interesting. I don't know how fair and how that'll translate moving down the road of like, hey, he's a pretty hateful guy, but we'll see. And the final flashback, again, a lot of heavy stuff of him with his mother and how impactful she was to his character. And I don't know, maybe for some people that might annoy them or something. I don't know. I love my mom a lot. So I'm like, okay, kind of reminds me of me and my mom. But uh, when he was in school, he used to get a lot of, or the mother would get a lot of complaints of like, yo, he beat up my kids. He, he destroyed my kids. What's going on? However, he would also have a lot of people calling into the mom to say, oh he stood up for my son he beat up some bullies thank you so he was doing good things he was just kicking a lot of ass and a lot of the bullies couldn't take that they got their ass whipped so they would run home mommy can you go like little and that was ultimately what gave his mom the idea of like no you make a great samurai like yeah use that power for good if you're whipping ass and you're already protecting people yeah you'll be an awesome samurai and i guess the whole ironic thing is despite the fact that he didn't make it as a samurai because you know he couldn't pass the test with the blood and ultimately he's actually working hand in hand with a mononoke he still hopes his mom is proud because he's still doing things his way how you know all along even when he was a kid he was protecting people but in his own right on his own terms and we find out after he asked the freaking beast towards the end of the damn chapter oh his name is kusanagi so the little creature the pokemon from now on we can say okay this is dora and kusanagi and the last piece of characterization for him which is good to note that uh, he don't eat humans or anything like that he eats little weeds and stuff which again i'm almost willing to bet entirely that he has eaten people just not in that form like when the gorilla said oh i, I could smell it from your scent maybe his scent changes entirely if that mark goes away again big prediction but it seems to be on on the nose and then we cut to later on that that female samurai she goes to the scene and notices that the gorilla mononoke has been vanquished and she's like well who the hell did that so definitely leading into okay probably in chapter two they're gonna have a big meeting maybe the mononoke or a new mononoke is going to attack and that's where they're going to link up and stuff like that because again they're in the cover color page together they're going to be probably working together i don't know if he's going to join team izanagi i'd prefer him not to actually to be honest with you i don't want him to join any of these squads i'd prefer to be like again think bleak of Ichigo he was a substitute soul reaper he never joined any squad or anything like that he was just dolo and the final scene was actually very interesting because it almost felt like if you take out like that scene with the woman that you know showed up to the scene you take her out of the chapter entirely this almost felt like it could have been a one shot in and of itself because they're just there at like a pier looking at the ocean and just chatting it up and saying again about their common bond of we're gonna make the world a more kind and happy 
please. Like, genuinely, this could have been a one-shot, which I want to say this was based off of a one-shot to begin with. If you just take out the girl and a couple of little setups and... Boom, this is what we got. But overall, I really liked it. I don't know, it felt like kind of heartwarming, but at the same time, it has hurdles to overcome of this dude is really prejudiced against the damn Mononoke, and the Mononoke designs are interesting, and it feels like this could go somewhere if Shonen Jump allows it. I'm not gonna say this is gonna be the next big thing, and if we're comparing it between this and the other new serialization, Ayo Shimon, I like Ayo Shimon a little bit more. It has a little bit more grit to it, a little more grittiness and edgy humor and all that jazz rolling with it and all the other manga references and stuff like that, but I'm not gonna sell this one short either i like a lot of the setups and it feels like it could go either way it could go traditional shonen -y way or it could also break some molds and use tropes and twist them on their head but we gotta wait to see either way curious what you guys think if you read chapter one of doran dororan what do you think of it how do you feel about the characters the setups again gives me like world trigger ish like a lot of different shonen blends in there but still going in the whole you know idea of we're slaying monsters essentially and uh your world thoughts and expectations if you haven't read it are you going to check it out i know i gave you a Full on breakdown, but I've been having fun doing that. Yeah, people. Doran Doran. Here we go. Shonen Jump. Don't cancel it. Come on, fam. Don't cancel this one. Like, we got two banging new serializations. Let's roll, baby. That's all I have for this one, though. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. If you liked anything I had to say or enjoyed the video, drop me a like. I'd greatly appreciate it. And if you want more from me, make sure to subscribe. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram. Hit that bell to get all notifications. And if you want to follow any of my other social media, links are in the description below. I'm from that world. And as always, people, have an awesome day. And remember the golden rule. Anime and manga. Oh, life. Bye. Have an awesome day. Peace in and Dora, 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 the Explorer. Chilling, killing Mononoke with Kusanagi. Kus yeah, Kusanagi. Have an awesome one. <laughs>